song's called Don't Stop Believing. I thought that would be a good one for uh, going into interviews. Uh, do I have a screen? Nothing there. Um, yeah, so Ian and Cole, that's my Twitter. I don't tweet that much. I'm just trying to figure it out, I'm learning a lot from Rear as it goes along. <laughs> Um, and first of all, why me? Why do you want the crusty old white male in the room? And I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest one here by quite a way. Um, <clears throat> I was interviewed in 1993 and 1994. Fortunately, the second time was okay, and for orthopedic training. But what I've done is also been involved in selection interviews for orthopedics since 2003. I've designed the selection procedure for most of that time. Um, I've also been on board, like uh, governance boards, uh, appointment panels, so I've interviewed for those positions, um, and also for hospital appointments for many years as well. Um, I have a reasonable amount of experience in interviews, so I'll keep going while we're uh, sorting out the slides. And this is why. Um, interviewing or selection is like my baby. I've done it, worked on it for many, many years, and I go up to show it to people, and they go, ooh, it's pretty ugly. But everyone thinks you can fix everything that goes wrong in training just by getting selection right. So uh, I know a lot of the science behind selection, I can tell you, you just can't get it right. Um, uh, human resource people at Coca-Cola spend millions of dollars on selection to select one or two people. Uh, and in Australia, for our system processes, sometimes we're selecting 50 or 100 people at once into these very high stress, high demand roles. Um, and I'm amazed that we get it right most of the time. So I'm going to start off with the black and white. The questions you should not be asked in any of you. Very straightforward anti-discrimination type stuff. Um, and then a little bit more of the grey, the things you should be asked. How do you approach it, actually, if you do get asked a, a question that you're not supposed to be asked? Um, maybe I'll just give you some tips on that, but there's no clear answer for that. Um, and also try and give you my little few tips on successful interviews. So shouldn't, what you shouldn't be asked. Now, it all comes down to anti-discrimination or discrimination in the workplace and employment. So a person must not, must not request, so request the information or require another person to supply information that could be used by the first person to form the basis of discrimination against any other, any other person. Now, the only caveat to that is that the whole interview process is about discriminating. You're trying to discriminate good candidates from slightly less good candidates. And so we, we're going to talk about two types of discrimination. There's the bad one, which you're not supposed to do, but I also want to sort of get your mind around the idea of good discrimination and, and what are the things that we actually do want to be able to select on. So it's the unjust or prejudicial treatment is the bad one. And then the ability to judge what is of high quality or good judgment. So that's what we're trying to tease out in an interview. Um, these are the rights uh, acts. The first one was in 1975, Racial Discrimination Act, put through by the Whitlam government. Uh, a lot of resistance to that act being passed. Um, and they involve disability, sex, race, age, sex, gender, colour, uh, service status in the military. Uh, there's, there's not much genetic discrimination happening yet in Australia, and the laws are pretty weak around that at the moment, but that's growing. Uh, political, national, religious discrimination, discrimination for a criminal record, uh, trade union uh, participation or being a carer, which is a really important one for you because you're often in the sort of time when you'll be a carer applying for jobs. Um, <coughs> these just uh, added strength to that original Discrimination Act. And then the Sex Discrimination Act, which Bob Hawke's probably most famous for, and unfortunately he died the other day. Um, to uh, really step up about uh, our, the powers of the law is uh, to intervene in um, instances of sexual discrimination. On top of that, there's New South Wales ACT, State Territory Government um, Acts that also bolster uh, anti-discrimination laws in each of the states. So there's a lot of legal behind it. So remember, it was the, the request for information is the illegal act. Okay? Doesn't matter what you do with it, is the request for the information. So the Human Rights Commission is probably the ones that, that you go to at the last step. It's when you can't get redressed by any other means. And they get about 2,000 complaints a year 
on about 4,000 grounds. But the main thing is almost 80% are related to employment. So what sort of things should you be asked? Um, I just wanted to put in a little caveat here. Um, I was on the AMA Federal Council back in 2005, 2006, when the, all the medical, well, the government wanted to increase medical student numbers, and you're partly the result of that. Um, at the time, we were very clear in saying that to the government, we don't need more of every sort of doctor. You want more GPs, but that's not what's going to happen. Um, and I think what the expectation was that all the training numbers would double in all the specialties, and that's just not the case. Our training numbers go up by 2 or 3% a year in keeping with sort of population demands. Um, and we're getting to this stage where there's a lot of people that won't, that very good doctors like all of you, that won't be able to get into the careers they want to do. So that's my caveat. Um, please have a plan B. And this is just demonstrated in these numbers from 2007 to 2012. Adult medicine, anaesthesia, emergency medicine and GP practice are, are still increasing. Paediatrics, I think, has plateaued a little bit more now. But if you look at m the others, they're not really growing at all. And again, it's the number of uh, clinicians needed is based on community demand, not medical graduate demand. Um, and that's where the mismatch is coming. I would also say that if you're interested in one of these, reconsider. We probably in the next five years, these will be done by uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. They are already better at reading most uh, radiology, radiological images than a human. Um, I looked at a number of the different specialty training colleges just to get some background for this, and I love this little bit on the bottom of the RACP, the college has decided to cease operating the ATSM system. Some of you might know what that is. It's a matching system that they created, trying to mirror what happens in North America, where you apply, colleges rank you, and then you get matched. Um, and it's a great idea when it works, um, but the College of Physicians couldn't make it work. So how do you get to an interview? Usually it's based on two things, a CV and referees. And this is the big problem that we have with referees. It's the Lego movie stuff. Everybody's awesome. Everyone gets, you know, 110%. And so we found in orthopedics, a number of the other specialties have found that, that probably 30 or 40% of their applicants are getting perfect referee scores. So then it becomes a non-discriminator. We use it in a strange way when you talk to a lot of other industries. Normally they would... Uh, do an interview, then talk to the referees. Maybe then do another re interview, then talk to some more referees. But we do it the other way around because we're trying to cull so many people. Cull's not a good word. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to reduce the numbers of people, um, that good type of discrimination, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and you see that on, that, uh, on the right, um, that it's really only the bottom 10 or 20% that referees are very good at actually removing from the selection process. So we need a better way. So that's where interviews come in. So interviews, you can see a much more normal distribution. And this, these are our actual numbers from last year in selection in orthopedics in Australia. Um, and where our cutoff was is right in the middle of that red box. So we're trying to create a cutoff right in the middle of where the group, the bulk of people are. So it's very hard. We use CVs as well, but unfortunately that correlates, a high CV in a lot of surgical training correlates with poorer um, outcomes during training. Because if you need to have a high CV to get on, you can have a slightly lower referee score. Sort of compensates for no support from your referees, or less support from your referees. One thing about CVs, um, be prepared to answer questions about your CV. Uh, every year we find one or two people that apply that have made things up on their CV. Um, and I'm sure I've talked to a number of the other colleges, they find the same thing. Um, it, if it's caught within the CV uh, paper process, then you'll be taken out of the selection process. If it's uh, picked up during an interview, you're going to have to answer some very curly questions. Um, <coughs> 
so what were the good questions? So we talked the, the ones you can't ask about, all those anti-discrimination things. What were the ideal questions that you should be asked? What I, as an interviewer, want to do for you as a candidate is help you show who you are. So your skills, your ability and your experience. Now you'll, you'll think that you've got very little experience because you're applying to get into a training program. But it's not just your experiences about being a doctor, it's your experiences in life, uh, dealing with other people in leadership roles. So there's lots of other experience you can bring to an interview. We're uh, trying to sort of look into a crystal ball because we want to pick on potential, not on current skills, which is again a little bit different to what a lot of major companies would do. They'd be picking on current skills and they'll build on themselves. But we, we see this pluripotential stem cell that we want to turn into an orthopedic surgeon or into a <laughs> renal medicine physician. Um, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to delve into that. What's the personality behind that? A lot of the good uh, interview processes will involve critical thinking. We'll, we'll put you in a situation that you have to actually reason and reason out loud. Um, because that's one way we can see that, one, you can handle a little bit of stress. We don't want to stretch you too much. But we also get you to think out loud so we can see the way your thoughts, thoughts run. And finally, and this one gets forgotten a lot, um, how are you a good fit for this particular college? So it might be emergency medicine. How are you a good fit for emergency medicine? And that means you need to understand what emergency medicine wants. Uh, and a lot of people come into interviews saying, OK, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, uh, <coughs> just because I think it's good fun. Uh, I want to cut. Pays well. So uh, a lot more depth of knowledge of preparing yourself in the interview is really important. I put that ability to move interstate with an asterisk there. Now, that borders on an unacceptable question unless it is a requirement of the role, the training role. So one of the colleges has a requirement. You have to go to New Zealand to do part of your training. So you have to move overseas for part of your training. Now, if that is a requirement written down, they have the right to ask about that. Are you happy to move interstate? For orthopedics, people move around to different hospitals all the time and often have to go to country areas. So it's reasonable for us to ask that sort of question. So what I was talking about, those expectations of the college. That's the College of Emergency Medicine on the left, and that's the orthopedic one on the right. But this is, you know, all of this is available off the internet, um, and I don't, know, don't have to tell you how to do all this. Um, but get, get into some background of what they actually want. And you read these different things on communication and teamwork. There are subtle differences between the colleges. So find out the exact thing that the, the college that you're interested in wants. Some general questions will be asked of everyone. And these are the ones that seem to come up again and again. So again, they're not asking you specifically about who you are at the moment. They're asking you to think ahead or think outside the box or be a bit blue sky thinking. So what have been three major advances? That's a really common one. Likely challenges, so it means you've actually thought a little bit about a future career in this particular area. Why would you like a career? That's just a standard one in this area. It almost, you, you, if you don't have a pat answer that you can speak out while you're doing your phone texting, then you're probably not going to get any further. Um, if you could advance the field of knowledge, that's a really good one because it actually makes people um, be a bit innovative. Um, what I talked about before, big data and machine learning is going to take over a lot of the jobs or affect a lot of the jobs that we do at the moment. And how would you manage the on-call demands? Now, again, this is bordering on one of those uh, not all right questions uh, because it may be in reference to you have three children at home or you've got a disabled parent or whatever like that. Um, but the on-call demands themselves are changed from specialty to specialty. So they do have the right to ask, in general terms, how you would manage this on-call. Um, most of the time, the, I think pretty much all the specialty colleges now would be doing panel interviews. They wouldn't let it up to one individual to decide whether you, and to give you a score, because it's just too open to challenge. Um, the more demand there is for jobs, the more structured and defensible and transparent the interview process has to be. So in orthopedics, we had something like seven to one, seven people applying for every one job. 
this year or last year. Um, so we have to be very transparent and we need to have multiple interview to viewers at multiple stations to try and make sure that it's um, even. Um, they, they will have also defined scoring rubrics. So if you have different panels, they're all scoring to the same uh, set of criteria. Good, these are the good types of answers, these are the poor types of answers. Um, just a little bit on what we've been doing. Um, AOA, orthopaedics is a male-dominated um, profession, there's no doubt about that, but we're trying to change that through lots of different avenues and we've developed a diversity strategy about it. But one of the things we did last year was insisted that all of our three member panels had at least one female and at least one non-orthopedic surgeon. Could have been the same person. Um, but what that meant was 45% of our in interviewers last year were female. And it made a big difference, I think. We actually found that the female interviewers were harder on both male and females than the males but their scores correlated very well. So they're both seeing the same things, but the females are just harder. And it may well be that they're harder on themselves as well. The types of questions you'll be asked, um, <coughs> credential verification happens in some places, that's what the CV type questions. Experience is always going to come up. Tell me about a time when. Opinion questions you'll get asked about, but they'll be very careful not to take you into areas where you might be asked to comment on any of those unacceptable questions I talked about before. Behavioural questions, they, they will usually always be, um, how would you manage this particular situation? Might have been bullying or um, uh, harassment or, um, or you've witnessed that, what would you do about it? So again, a bit of a hypothetical. Um, <coughs> Always be questions about the competencies that that particular college requires. Um, and you might see some case questions in orthopaedic. We might have a basic anatomy type question just to establish a baseline. I wonder where that bell was going. I thought I was getting tapped on. Um, how do you approach it for your side of things? So you're an applicant. What are the good things that you can do to, do, uh, to answer well? Um, as an interviewer, I want to hear what you would do not one could, or you could probably, or you could do this. So I would do this, I think this, own, own the answer. Um, if the interviewers are prompting you, that probably means you haven't covered the area that they're, that they're thinking they want the answer to. So don't take it as that you've completely stuffed it up, they're just trying to help get more information out of you so they can do that good type of discriminating. The interviewers may well sit there quietly and stare at you. Um, so be ready for it, be ready for it, practice for it. Um, for an interviewer, a silence feels like about two seconds. For an interviewee, it feels about five minutes. Okay, so if they're sitting there quietly, you don't have to fill the space. Just sit back, be quiet, wait for the next question. Okay, they, they might be get, gathering their thoughts again because this is the 18th interview they've done. You may be cut off mid-sentence, it's really important because it's always dead on time. So you might be about to launch in a fantastic answer and you get cut off. Don't take that personally, that's just part of the interview process. Doesn't mean you have, you've done anything wrong. So what's the future? Probably more teleconferencing, more Zoom, Skype, that sort of stuff, um, interviews, just to stop having to tr bring the meat in from all around the world or around the, the country. You know, we only really need to talk to your brain, so we don't really need the rest of you. Um, certainly the increasing diversity is coming along in all the specialties um, and O and G is the other way around, they need to get more my, men into O and G because they've got such a high proportion of females. So they've, they've got a sort of the same problem in a different way. Often you'll get something like scenarios and then what if this happened to put you into that, okay I've got to critically reason my way through this and greater focus outside of technical skills. So all those other communication professionalism, ethics will come up a lot. Um, some of the interviews, particularly in the North America, and it probably will end up leaking into here, is um, using psychometric testing before interview, so you can target the particular Myers-Briggs or whatever in your interview process. You can tailor questions to the particular interviewee. When I was interviewing, we were told, or uh, the panel was told you have to ask the same questions of every candidate 
and one of the panel early on asked a female if she was uh, planning on having a baby during training. And so all the males got asked exactly the same question all the way through. Now, it doesn't make it a right question, but that, that's probably not the best way of sorting out the bad types of questions. And this last little bit is, you, you might see this coming soon, additive tasks to increase cognitive load. So the idea is, I'm interviewing you, I give you a little wooden puzzle to do while we're interviewing. Some of you might have interviewed for Newcastle University, we do that up there for our selection process. Um, and the little puzzle is to give you cognitive load. So when you are asked a question while you're doing the puzzle, it's harder for you to lie. Because it takes a lot of cognitive load to lie, and if you're already trying to, do, oh no no no, I, I didn't go to work that day, sorry. Um, but it, it's there's really good evidence of this now. And the other thing is it stops social desirability, or reduces social desirability. So it stops you trying to fit in with what the interviewers or you think the interviewers want. So cognitive load will actually demonstrate more of your true personality or your character traits. So what do you do if A happens? I better speed up a bit, I'm sorry. Um, if it's the questions of protected status, most of you won't speak up. In uh, interview selection processes, they can ask about age, race, uh, um, family, those sort of things, but only in the application documents. They shouldn't be asked in an interview. Will you speak up? I would say probably 95% of you won't. And that's pretty standard, and we talked about the fear before. The fear will stop you doing it. So what do you do? Don't worry about that. Um, it may be tempting to lie. Um, I would not recommend that, because if you're found to have lied in an interview, that's grounds for the dismissal process usually, or removal of, from the process of selection. Um, answer truthfully, because it doesn't imply that you consent to the question. It doesn't make it any better for the person asking the question. And immediately after the interview, write down what you're concerned about, what the answer you gave, who asked you, even just a description, where it happened and when it happened. If you do have a problem, get in touch first with the colleges because they want to sort this out, of the presidents or the CEOs, and then I would build up AMA, it'd be good people to talk to, um, probably then Youth Law Australia for anyone under 25 who have access to that, and then anti-discrimination boards as well. Don't record interviews, it's illegal. Um, some, it happens, I, I heard of one happening recently for a professor appointment. Um, so what can you do? Research the organisation, as I said, get on, find out all about them, what they do. A lot of orthopaedic people apply not knowing what our joint registry is. Answer as someone in the role, I said, I would do this, I would behave this way. Find someone else that's got on recently and practice with them. Prepare for a bad station. What are you going to do if you get asked a curly question? You don't want to decom decompensate and then not do well in the next station. And the numbers thing, prepare for what are you going to do if you don't get into that particular specialty. Understand the selection process, pretty straightforward. A answer the question. A lot of people give great answers, but they're unrelated to what they've just been asked. Use your own experience. Find a mentor if you haven't got one. They're really important. They will help you in many different ways. And thank the interviewers at the end. They've come in, usually spend a weekend day talking to 20 different people uh, and being unpaid for it. So thank you and good luck.